In addition to serving as the 12th president of the college, he uh, teaches courses on various topics, including the Constitution, Aristotle, and recently on C.S. Lewis. He's the author of several books, a growing number, most recently Churchill's Trial, Winston Churchill, and the Salvation of Free Government. Uh, it's been my privilege to work with him at Hillsdale College for the past 16 plus years. Um, his topic today is American Politics and the American Constitution. Please welcome back to the podium Hillsdale College President Larry P. Arne. Tim is tall. Thank you, Tim. Do you guys do you guys follow Twitter? I don't do it, and I don't even know how to do it. But I can report because of the Wall Street Journal just lately that Trump has responded that intelligence agencies are illegally leaking information, just like Russia, and they're writing fake news and going crazy with conspiracy theories and blind hatred. And so the purpose of my Reporters to tell you, once again, Donald Trump is backing down under pressure. <laughs> that guy's the dangest thing I ever saw. <laughs> um, thank you, Christopher Caldwell, who's a thoughtful man. And uh, I kept thinking while he was talking, uh, we are at the college completing the official biography of Winston Churchill, which is the biggest biography ever written, and it's going to eventually be... 31 volumes, counting 23 volumes of documents. And we're just in the middle of, we're just finishing volume 20, which goes to December 1944. Think about the world in December 1944. And the worst thing in it, that world, was Adolf Hitler, who was weakening really fast. And the next thing, worst thing in it, was Joseph Stalin, who was strengthening very fast. And Britain had declared war on the Soviet Union, uh, sorry, on Nazi Germany over the issue of Poland. And the Polish government in exile after Germany and the Soviet Union cooperated in taking Poland was in London. And Churchill was representing those guys and felt honor bound, although he didn't personally make the guarantee, to try to get a free Poland. And you get that. In fact, eventually the London Poles would fly back to Poland, where most of them were arrested and shot, and the rest of them were converted into communists. Now, what does Churchill think about all that? He's, he, Russia is, the Soviet Union, at the end of the Second World War, well, they took 75% of the, of the Allied casualties. They had this massive military at uh, Yalta and at Potsdam, the United States, announced early in the conference, once Franklin Roosevelt, once Harry Truman, that we're getting out of this place within six months and you guys in Europe are gonna be on your own. And that makes the Soviet Union simply the dominant power. And Churchill didn't like uh, communism. You should, uh, when it took over Russia back in 1918, he referred to it as the hairy paw of the baboon spreading over Russia. But it's a very interesting thing, and I invite you to look at this biography we're doing. I'll send you the extracts if you want me to. I mean, these books are, they're very academic books, and that means that this particular book is going to be about 2,700 pages long and have 4,000 footnotes in it. <laughs> and it's full of original source documents, but it's still, it's riveting, I can tell you. Because what does Churchill think? When Churchill sees Hitler, he thinks Germany is in that place. And Germany is that kind of nation and people. And there's, this thing is really dangerous. And he fears that. And he doesn't, he, he immediately betry, tries to build a massive coalition against them. He did try to over, overturn the Bolshevik Revolution with force. Didn't get that done, but what he wants to do in 1945 is try to find a way to contain them. They're not gonna go away. 
They are chiefly interested in their part of the world, he writes, he says, in the uh, very famous Iron Curtain speech in 1946. It's an enigma wrapped in a mystery inside a riddle. It might be got those out of order. He said, but I think there is a key, the Russian national interest. And Churchill's strategy with him in that Iron Curtain speech where he and that, that speech announced the beginning of the Cold War. In that speech, he was looking for a way to work with them. And goodness, the evil that they constituted then and the danger that they constituted then, that was really serious. I mean, one of the worst things in human history, one of the biggest body counts in human history. But you have to, and you know, to judge all that, and I'll just tell you, you'll find if you go read all that, or I will send it to you, you will find that Churchill is very careful about picking fights with big powers and very ready to avoid those fights, if at all possible. In part because Churchill's whole idea about all of this is we want to live in a liberal society. And what liberal means is us, people like us, everybody, every color, every group, if you can get it, right? and they should live of their own. Most of the resources of the nation should be in their hands, and they should be responsible for their children and their lives, and then they can live fully human lives. Whereas in a society that's perpetually at war, then that society becomes regimented, and everything is conscripted, and there's no room for people to be free. And that's why Churchill, who won his glory in the Second World War and became the greatest living man and became treated that way after 1940, and he already had a 40-year-long political career, very distinguished, but nobody had ever treated him and hardly anybody else had ever been treated in a free democratic country in politics like the greatest living man, but he was treated that way for the rest of his life. And then he's asked, what shall we call this war? And he said, that's easy. This is the unnecessary war. We should have prevented this in 1935 or before when we could see what Hitler was and he could have been stopped if we'd just built weapons. And so when you look at the world the way Christopher Caldwell described today, just remember the long list of things that he announced that he does not know. Because there's a long list of things that we don't know and we can't know. And the people who have the deepest knowledge of those things are looking like they're partisans in a contemporary political controversy. And so it's hard to believe what they say too. I mean, obviously in the last 48 hours, some things have been done that are radically improper and probably crimes. And they have been done in interviews between people who are said to be high in the intelligence community with big newspapers, especially the New York Times. So the point is, when, when we judge all this, we should be thinking about the end. And what is the end? We want our country to be safe. We want our country to be at peace. We want to have a limited government where there will be resources that can fructify, Churchill loved to say, in the pockets of the people. And you know, it's very big now and there's constantly an emergency. And you have to, and, and I just want you to know, and see, I'm a very patriotic guy. And I don't know how much you like communism, but if you like it in any respect, you like it better than I do. But how are we gonna live in the age where war is disastrous? So I, I thank you for that talk. And I learned a lot from it. And I don't know what to do about this, except that we should surely, in this daydreams age, do two things that are the cornerstone of the current administration policy. And one is look to ourselves first. And the other is rebuild our military. And you can go on all day long about how friendly Donald Trump is
to Vladimir Putin, but two years and three years and five years today, if the bills pass and the money is spent, we're going to be much more formidable to Vladimir Putin and everybody like him, and that will be a good thing. This, is the, uh, this year is the 35th anniversary of these conferences. And I'm going to invite you to think what an incredibly weird thing this is. And first of all, it's a generation old, almost exactly. And I am, have been responsible for them for half that time, half a, half a generation. And if you just think about it for a minute, it's an insane thing for a little liberal arts college to do. And most everything else we do in external relations is insane. And so I thought, because it's an anniversary, it'd be a good time for to me explain the meaning of our madness. Uh, and you know, if you, want a, if you want a vivid and humorous example of our madness, just cast your mind back to Mark Stein's speech last night. That was crazy, wasn't it? <laughs> that guy's brilliant, but Lord, how does he come up with all that? <laughs> These conferences started in 1982. What was going on in the world? Uh, what was going on with me in the world was that I had married Penelope Houghton in England in 1979, and in August of 1981, we had moved back from Margaret Thatcher's Britain to watch Ronald Reagan be elected president. Uh, I, I used to think back in those days it was lucky for me to move to a country. And Ronald Reagan remembered that I had moved to England to go study Winston Churchill not long before Margaret Thatcher, and then moved back before him. And he said, you know, you ought to move around more, he said. <laughs> what was happening at the college? It was in the middle of a lawsuit on its way to the Supreme Court. This uh, obscure little college that had been famous back in the Civil War and I will argue for reasons that are like the reasons it's famous today, the same kind of problem, the same kind of solution, uh, was becoming very well known because it was in a lawsuit with the government of the United States. And that lawsuit is a harbinger of everything that has happened in politics since then, and it still goes on, including the stuff that's on the front page of the paper this morning. So what was the lawsuit about? Uh, well, there was the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And that's not enough, by the way, because they've since split that thing into, how many are there? They're like, like now nine million cabinet offices. And, um, and think about that for a minute. Do you know what the original cabinet offices were? They were war or defense, treasury or tax and spend, attorney general, law, and Secretary of State, foreign relations. If you think about those four things, you can't have a government without those four things. And also, only governments do those four things. The Department of, of uh, Health, Education, and Welfare was from the 60s. The Department of Education is from 1979. Hillsdale College is from 1884. There was education before there was a Department of Education. <laughs> and to this day, the vast majority of education does not go on in the federal government. But think about the other 12 cabinet offices that have been added, right? Because they're all like that. They're all commerce, you know? Did you think there was no commerce before the Department of Commerce? They're all like that. Housing. You know, did you realize that until the 60s, the people of the United States were sleeping outside? <laughs> Even in Michigan. And so this agency, you see, uh, when the Sputnik went up, uh, they had done the GI Bill, and we had always taken the GI Bill, and that's a World War II thing. And that looks to me like that's constitutional. Right? That's a defense measure, that's a reward for people who serve in the military, which is very much part of the original Constitution. In fact, of the 17 things that are in Article I, Section 8, 8 or 9, depending on how you count piracy, 
are about national defense. So that looked okay to me and to us at the college, and we accepted that warmly. And then they started because of the Sputnik, the National Defense Student Loan Program, and that was aid directly to the students. And so and the way that was set up, I can remember when I negotiated my own to go to undergraduate school. And, I, and a bank and a government and me were negotiating. And the college didn't, where I went, didn't really deal with it very much, right? But of course in 1970, whatever it was, in the Carter administration, seven, six, something like that, um, they announced that if you receive these loans, that is say, kid borrow some money to go to college, now if you accept these loans, you have to become signatory to all the titles of the Higher Education Act that have to do with that. And that's a very comprehensive form of regulation. And so a whole lot of colleges initially said no, and we said no, and very few, in fact, two from way back then, us and Grove City College, stuck. And it was hard for us, and we didn't really understand it. I invite you sometime, I'll show you if you want me to. Uh, the minutes, I've read the minutes of the Hillsdale College Board of Trustees back to when, right? When they're in this great, fabulous handwriting in these big ledger books back in the 19th century. But these minutes are the longest minutes of all from 1967. And they're 11 single space type pages long. And the minutes open with a guy. His, his name was Briggs, of Briggs Stadium in Detroit where the Tigers used to play. And he's headed up a task force. And the college is poor, in a church, poor as a church mouse. And he says, we need to sign up for this money from the federal government. All it requires is non-discrimination, and we've never done that. We were an abolitionist college in the Civil War. We're going to dedicate a statue in May of Frederick Douglass, who spoke on our campus twice. And the, and the photograph that he put on his visit, visiting card when he went to see people, it, it, apparently he liked the photograph, was taken in our central hall. See, and, and this Mr. Briggs says, look, we don't discriminate, and they say you don't, you don't, you shouldn't discriminate, and so we, we won't have a problem with that. Now, of course, by the way, they require that you discriminate. <laughs> he said, so we're going to go broke. We need to take this money. And that's, you know, probably the most influential and wealthy man on the board, and a task force of three people come and recommend that. And I don't know if you serve on nonprofit boards, but I will tell you that things like that always pass. And this one gives rise to 11 pages of minutes. And they vote 16 to 3. He actually lost one guy on his task force and he picked up one other. Not to do it. And then the president of the college named J. Donald Phillips said a prayer for the college. That was going on when we started these conferences. The court case was settled in 1984. If we'd gotten five more votes on the Supreme Court, we would have won. <laughs> it was a narrow deal. Um, but think what that means. In the course of the controversy about this, the Department of Education twice had speakers at academic, you know, academic conferences where all the colleges that get their money come and, and hear what they have to do is what really happens at these conferences. And they said at two of these things, the colleges that are refusing to sign up, we're going to destroy them. I said that out loud. I quoted in a book I wrote about this. So, we sue them. And they, and, and Health Education and Welfare Department passed this regulation. The Health Education and Welfare Department is enforcing this regulation. And the judge of first instance is an employee of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare executive, judicial, and judiciary. 
I mean, in that legislative, all in the same hands. And in a miracle, we won in Denver, Colorado. And so the secretary do what they can do to this day. The next day, he overturned the judgment. We've invested a year in legal fees and uncertainty and fear and wondering about our age-old business because by 1982, we're already a really old college. And gracious sakes, there are people at the college who knew Abraham Lincoln and helped to found his, co his, his party. Good grief. Three Medal of Honor winners in the Civil War. And the point is, our existence is called into question by a thing that is on its face in both the obvious and the detailed respects simply unconstitutional. Not the way a free government must proceed. And then we go to the Supreme Court and we get beat. And then we did that crazy thing. We decided to, to, to go without the dough. And here we stand. And that's the moment in the middle of that when we started talking to the public. As we had done, by the way, back in the day when the slavery crisis was underway. Why was Frederick Douglass on our campus twice? We had speakers come and we published what they wrote about the crisis in the Union about the repudiation of the Declaration of Independence, about the distortion of the Constitution that is involved in the claim that the Constitution of the United States requires the federal government, which was the claim in the day, to enforce the rules of slavery even on all the territory not yet organized as states. And why did that arise anyway, by the way? Because you know the funny thing about slavery, because back in those days, the predecessors of Hitler, and I don't mean the Southern people, I'm one of them. I mean some of their leaders, intellectuals. They're the predecessors of Hitler. Indeed, John C. Calhoun was a student of a historic, historicist student of Friedrich Hegel at Yale College. Just got his name taken off, of, off a, co a college there at Yale. Which I think, I don't know what I would have done about that. I'm just so happy everything at our place that's old is named after people who like Lincoln. But, but, but the point is, what they thought was that these black people had evolved to be lesser than we, and it would be an abomination to include them among us. And we didn't like that, and we fought about that. But the point is, the reason it came, the whole thing came to a point was because slavery is an institution extremely dependent on firm laws. And that's because you can talk all day about how happy the slaves are. They just keep trying to get away. <laughs> and so you got to have a law, like in the Alabama Slate Code, which is in our Constitution Reader, that you have to ride posse. Every free white male, slave owner or no, has to ride posse one night a month looking for runways patrol in the land, right? That is not limited government, you see? And so that fight about that, that's what that was about back then. But what's it about now? Because it's an old college. Why should the federal government have an opinion about the quality of our instruction? Because Anybody in here a Pillsdale College parent? The Libbies, you know? Lots, right? Are you concerned with the quality of your students' education? They had this long thing with Betsy DeVos, right? How are you going to make these charter schools accountable? And I never heard the word parent. And that means, as I say last night, infantilized. But if that's happening in education, that's happening everywhere. That's the whole government. And now it's half the economy. Think back, it's more than half the economy. If you count the regulatory cost, if you just count the direct spending, state, federal, and local, I think it's about 43% of the whole economy of the United States, up from the historically prevalent 8, 10, or 11. 
So the government is really big, and if you put in the regulatory cost, and remember what that means, regulation means that if you're in the college business, you might hear from the Department of Education, and that means you're hearing from all three branches at once. And that's a bad day when they write you a letter. In our athletic conference, uh, the Office of Civil Rights, the Department of Education, heard a complaint from some people who live their lives to make complaints like this. Because we're discriminating, it turns out, in our athletic conference, because in basketball, the girls play before the boys. And, you know, that's, what are they, the warm-up? And, you know, the obvious thing to say is, well, no, they're the draw. You know, I mean, what I, it, 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 so, of course, everybody else in the conference is regulated by these guys. And so they're all wondering what I'm going to do, right? Because I can just tell them to go stick it. And, you know, I'm inclined that way. <laughs> so... So, so, <laughs> so they all look at me and say, what are you going to do? And I said, well, whatever you work out with them, I'll go along with it, unless they, let, they, they lodge any implication that they have the power to control us, and then I'm going to sue them. And I said, because we can't let that rot start. Remember, you guys got a lot of dough we don't have. They'll sometimes say, yeah, but you know, you guys raise a lot of dough. And I always say, no, I don't. People give it. Maybe they'd give it to you if you'd do your work more honestly. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> do you see what that means, though? They're going to break the federal government of the United States. And so what we did for like three years was we, one year the girls first, the next year the boys first. And everybody hated that, but nobody hated it as much as the girls. Right? And I'm talking about, you know, Hillsdale College is a weird thing, but our girl athletes are really good. And they're, you know, they're smart and all that, too. But these girls at these radical public schools, they hate going second. And they hate the change because nobody can get used to who plays when. And so we quietly, I guess we did because it happened by osmosis as far as I know, just went back to the old system, which everybody loved, and of course, just lately, we've heard from them again. Now, why would the federal government of the United States of America care about that? And where is the authority for that? And if they care about that, they care about every single thing. And of course, then, that raises the problem, doesn't it? Because when the government gets so big that it can manage every single thing, then it's bigger than the people it governs. And then the representation system is threatened because you need a big free people in a big private sphere to be strong enough to control a government that in turn is strong enough to protect their freedoms from one another and from abroad. That is the crisis of our generation. Born in thought three or four generations ago, in the 19th century, back when it was influencing some Americans to think that slavery was a good thing, whereas those in the founding generation, none of them did. So it's an old crisis, but now it's the immediate thing about it is old, 35 years old, and it's coming to a head of some kind. Donald Trump has been so far the direct enemy of the centralized bureaucratic state. It's shocking how much he is that. And of course, now look what's happening. The election was illegitimate. And here's the reasons why. He lost the popular vote. Seems to be a fact. But he was elected under the oldest prevailing system and most successful at gathering the opinions of what Madison calls the great body of the people and producing an executive that is accountable to them and yet strong enough to protect them and execute the law. And just think, what I just said, right, do you realize in all of human history that has happened very seldom? 
And in, on the face of the earth today, there are not many places where that is secure. I mean, the reason it's not fully right to trust Russia, although I'm with Mr. Caldwell, I would befriend them best I could while I was building weapons to make sure we can defend ourselves against them and anybody else, right? That'd be my policy, which I think is more or less what you said, right? You, you can't really quite trust them because they do mess with the press, right? Do you know if the courts are fair? I don't. So the point is, when you get that, then you've got something more trustworthy. And one element of our being, the best in, in all of that in human history, has to do with this constitution that prescribes the way the president is elected. And if you got rid of it, you would still need something with complexity in it just to gather all those opinions from all over the land. And the Electoral College achieves this unprecedented thing in all of human history. You just have to know a gross fact about America and then you'll see this amazing point because it is staggering how important it is. Nobody ever started a country on a coastline and, start and extended a nation all the way across a continent. It is one of the greatest human stories of all time. And they kept the same constitutional form across the whole deal. And by the way, despite the Civil War. And at each stage, the people in the new parts had the same authority over the whole as the people in the old parts. Never colonies. And think about how important that is, right? Because if you just, you can't upheaval, what does it take to be a people? You can't have consent of the governed, the first check, uh, the first feature of constitutional rule is consent of the governed. You can't have that unless you have a people. But the people have to live somewhere. And it's not just that we had these great principles, we got this amazing land. And all of it, wow. Washington names it the Continental Army and it's after he's dead that anybody in, in the American government finds out how big the continent is or anything like what's on it. Lewis and Clark when they come back. First report to Thomas Jefferson. And so they thought that they would, they don't know what that land's like and they don't know the people who are going to live there but they're setting up a constitutional system that will re represent them just like the people in Virginia and Massachusetts who were key to the revolution. And the Electoral College is one instance of that. And that marvel is ill understood and simply discarded. But then the next thing, of course, is the Russians stole the election. And they did it for the following reasons. Putin was afraid of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> now, I was afraid of Hillary Clinton, <laughs> but that's a different situation. <laughs> that's the first one. The second one, They have the goods on Trump. Oh, I'm sorry, no, not the second one. Fake news. Let's say there's fake news. What would you do about it? Would you give somebody power to stop it? Right? I mean, let's say we decided Caldwell down there is an idiot and we don't want to hear him anymore, right? One way to fix it is don't come. Another way to fix it is don't invite him back. A third way to do it would be appoint an official and shut him up. This whole thing that there should be some official reaction to fake news is a direct attack on the First Amendment. And remember, the First Amendment has the most important freedoms in them because they are, they are the essentially human freedoms. We are the talking beings. That's why we can have politics and freedom. The next one is Putin's got the goods on Trump. And that's either because 
he's making him rich. Or else it's because they have a tape of a prostitute that Trump hired to do vile things on a bed in a Moscow hotel because Obama and his wife had slept in that bed. <laughs> now, I don't know if that happened. <laughs> and you don't either. But I will tell you, I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't know of anything like that. <laughs> but also, it arises in a partisan context. And this thing that are going on today, right? I mean, here's a scandal. Did you know that a presidential candidate went on a trip to Afghanistan, Germany, France, and the United Kingdom in order to bolster his foreign policy credentials and aides of his talk to people in all of those countries in order to set up the trip. And that person was Barack Obama running for president in 2008. And so now Michael Flynn has talked to some Russians about to be national security director. And the question is, did he mention those sanctions which 30 days from now he's going to be in charge of implementing or altering? Did he speak to them before that? Well, heck, surely he did. But if that's the deal, did he conspire with them to steal the election? And all that gets mixed up, right? But where are those things coming from? And, and the thing is, I don't know. You don't either. And you can't tell. And on any timeline in which each of us is going to be required to make decisions, we're still not going to be sure. And that means the public trust is shaking. It's dangerous. And the chief parties who are speaking in Washington have things at stake. And I'll close with just two points. Uh, how do you fix this? Nothing will do in the end except to restore both the Constitution and the principles behind it. They say we are a people and the government is ours and must do what we say. That is not the principle of the European Union. That is not the principle of much of the political spectrum in America today, but it is the only one that will lead to civilization in any country. We should be working on that, and the reform of the regulatory state is a key step, and that is undertaken this very day. The second thing is we should treat all of this seriously. And we should treat it seriously in the way citizens treat it seriously. We should think it through and get better every day at explaining it to people. And here's a thing to explain, and I'll close with this. I mentioned it last night. I t I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Because the New York Times guy who wrote that article that we liked, I mean, we wouldn't have read it quite that way ourselves, but we're not the New York Times. Uh, he asked me this. He said, this is a very high-minded place. The first thing he said to me, and I said, thank you. And he said, uh, what does classical learning have to do with politics? And I will tell you, I'm confident he knew the answer. I'm not making fun of him. Uh, I think he was an educated man, and I think he's an honest man. You know, until he attacks me sometime. But um, What does classical learning have to do with politics? And I said, well, there's Plato's Republic, you know, there's Aristotle's politics. <laughs> and he said, what was contemporary politics? And I read him this, and I'll read it to you. Aristotle says that despotisms don't last because they produce friction. 
Nobody likes them. Everybody hates them. They don't even make tyrants happy. But he says, when they last, they last this way. I will read you. It's Politics, Book 5, Chapter 11. There are things that were mentioned some time ago as tending toward preservation of tyranny. As much as possible, preserving it, by cutting down those things, those who stand out, and getting rid of those with proud thoughts, not allowing common meals, clubs, education, or anything else of that sort, but guarding against everything from which two things customarily come, pride and trust, pride and trust. Pride, you know, is a, is a sin in the Christian world, but if what you mean is civic pride, and pride in your status as a citizen, that is not a vice. And of course, if you have that, you don't look like the, at the government like you work for it. He goes on. They preserve themselves by not letting there be any schools or other collegial gatherings for leisure pursuits and doing everything that will keep all the people as unknown to one another as possible since familiarity breeds a greater degree of mutual trust. Another measure is to require, do you know why the government, the administration of the government of the United States was localized in a very radical way? It wasn't just that it grew up that way, it did, but also because then we could know each other. It's the reason it's important that our college not be huge, because the intense activity that has to go on there requires us to know each other. And then we can trust each other. And then we can argue. And also, we don't lock up our backpacks in the daytime. And, you know, I, I shouldn't say this. There'll be some disaster. But we're here. Our house is unlocked in the middle of a college campus. Go there and steal some stuff. <laughs> I trust you. Another measure is to require the townspeople to be always out in the open and spend their time near, near the palace gates, no privacy, since in that way what they are doing would be least likely to go unnoticed and they would get in the habit of thinking small as a result of always thinking like slaves. That is the direction. It is not the intent. That is the direction of these rules that dominate the society from a central place. And we have to stop that. And we're going to. Thank you. Uh, we have some time uh, for questions. Uh, questions for President Arn. We have microphones. Please wait for the microphone. and. Uh, Fire away. Uh, yes, sir. By the, yes, sir. By the aisle there. You got it. Oh. oh. I'm not sure that there's any element of that that contains any edu education about the document that they are supporting and defending. Is there any way the college can reach out to the Department of Defense to help those people that may lay down their lives to better understand that document? That's a good question. Um, now, I was on the board of the Army War College. And I uh, liked that a lot. I'm very proud to be there. And I, they mentioned I got a medal. And the reason I got it is because I know how not to be a jackass on a board. <laughs> it's actually true that me, the chairman, and I were the only ones who got one. <laughs> Says something about the other members. But uh, I love them. And I think we, we set out to try to help them with their curriculum. And it was hard. And they're, you know, they're very honorable people. Do you know a colonel in the United States Army? Uh, the Army War College is full of colonels. And they all know how long they need to sleep to remain effective for six months. And they all know it because they've tested. 
And if you ask them, they will give you their number. I mean, it's really honorable. And they are pretty ignorant about some things, although they've got common sense. So those institutions, when they, in West Point and the service academies, know a little about the Air Force Academy, um, they hire academics to teach. Uh, and what do they teach, by and large? You know. So there's a problem there. Uh, what I would say is uh, what we can do about that, I mean, first of all, our job, uh, we run a little bitty college at a very excellent level. Come and see. I invite you. If you haven't been, you'll see. Everybody's smart, really hard to get in, work them until they drop, then work them some more, uh, make fun of them if they whine. Actually, the nicer people in the college comfort them, but I don't. And uh, love them, we all do that, and I do that. And then we want that to radiate everywhere. 1.8 million registrations for online courses with Hillsdale College now. Lots of them are soldiers, and the courses are free. Uh, lots of soldiers' groups form. Uh, we all at the college, anybody whose name gets known, and that means anybody who teaches an online course, anybody uh, who, who comes to public notice, goes to an event, they all get more speaking invitations than they can take. But they, uh, I and everyone else, except the ones from the military, whenever we can. But that's the thing. And, you know, we've started these charter schools. And, you know, just to, to get the magnitude of the task in front of us, um, um, two millennia of learning have been effaced to a very considerable extent. And so there are three million teachers in America, public school teachers, they haven't all learned the right things anymore. And so it'll take time to fix that. So our business is to show how. Uh, you know, we're going to have, when we get them done, probably, we're going to have 50 charter schools. And they're good. And it can be done. Get the, if, you, if you get the right teachers and the right curriculum, which is not that hard, and you get the right intensity of effort, and you get the right leader, then our proposition is proved repeatedly in the suburbs and once in an urban environment and two more working on it, you can teach anybody. And that's what we want to prove. And then that proved there'll be opportunities. Remember, there's a school reformer who's Secretary of Education now. So that's hopeful. So that's the best answer I can give you. view the role of social media in the getting to know other people and therefore building trust. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, so the answer is it's incredibly important. I personally just can't bear it. Um, so we have a massive, I think we're slants. Brad Lowry, somebody like that. How, is it true that we have seven billion followers on Facebook? True, true, yeah, yeah. No, I think we're the biggest in liberal arts colleges, is that true? We're the biggest in liberal arts colleges, and we have the biggest Twitter feed, or one of them, and we have the biggest Instagram, whatever that is. And, um, and see, I'm, I'm like a big time computer jockey, but I think social media is for people who have time, and I don't, so I don't do it. But, but we do it now, and it's huge, and it's very important. And we were, five years ago, we were nowhere, and then I heard that nerd back there. And so now we're just tops, right? And yeah, I do think it's important. And, and the, my, the only time I ever hear, I have three friends from high school, and I used to let Facebook come into my inbox. I don't anymore. But that, but I, you know, in about six months, I caught up on everybody from Pocahontas High School in Pocahontas, Arkansas. And, you know, they're all old, like me. But then, and I, I did enjoy that. 
I just don't have time to do it. So once a year, I go look, maybe. Is that a good answer? Do you like social media? No, no. Yeah, okay, good. Well, we won't chat. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Dr. R, would you comment on some practical things that you would either expect or that the new Secretary of Education might do to try and um, undo or unravel the regulation uh, or ask it said? Yeah, yeah. I have, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, I, I, there was some danger that I was going to be appointed to that job, but I snuffed it out. <laughs> no, actually, he preferred her, and he was right to. Um, yeah, it, you have to change the conditions. It, it rules on condition of some money. It rules everything for part of the money, 10% of the money. So what you want to do, the general direction is, you want to empower the school as the governing unit. And what that will introduce into the system right away is a wide uh, variety of influences and conditions and diversity in the way schools are. Right now it's very centralized, you know. And uh, the Republicans have made it a lot more centralized with their standardized testing and their pursuit of excellence in a thing that they cannot define. Um, so I would do that and then I would also let parents shop around. And I think charter schools are better than vouchers, uh, but you've got to get the charter law right so that they have a lot of latitude how they run. And then you will make them accountable to the people who are closest to the children. And that will be a net gain. And the gains would start soon and grow with time, although you won't make it all great in a year, or even five years. Oh, after you've done that, then, you know, so I've had in mind a two-step process. The first step, you just do that, and then just watch things start happening. And then in the second step, you would extend that for 10 years, so you know the schools have certainty. And then in the third step, you would abolish the United States Department of Education. <laughs> I was privileged to be with Trammell Crowe, who at that time, the world's largest real estate developer. And I asked him, how did he build his team worldwide? And he said that he trusted the guys and gals and helped them live up to that trust. What I see today is a lot of crushing people that we ought to be helping. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't follow that. Who got crushed? The people that should be helping the, those. Uh, oh, you mean in the country? Help. Yeah. I see. I wasn't doing Tram the crush. Trammell's idea was to trust a man and help him live up to that trust. Yeah. Thank, so thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And I agree with that, I, if I understand it. I think I do. I, I will tell you something I learned being a teacher. And uh, it's just a golden thing. And I never wanted to, my father was a teacher. I always loved going to school. If we hadn't started having children, I'd still be in college. <laughs> uh, but I never wanted to be a professor. Never applied, turned down jobs, and then I took this crazy job. And I took this job because they were friends of Abraham Lincoln who started the college. And I thought, wow, I could do that. I, I get that. And it provides a key for governing the college, but here's the key, it's just what you say. So then I start teaching. And you know, I'm not the worst talker in the county. And I think I can do that, right? And I was okay, but I noticed that I would be saying the most important things and they would yawn. And that's very demoralizing. And so I, I came home one time there's a General Burgess, who's a three-star general retired, and his daughters are really brilliant, Julia and Regina, and Regina's the elder, salutatorian, I think. And I was telling her a story about Winston Churchill, and General Burgess's daughter yawned in the middle of it. And I went home, and uh, my wife said, how was class? And I said, you know, I take the most beautiful things I know, and I bore them with them. And she said, you should probably stop doing that. <laughs> and I said, and I said, well, I'm thinking about it. So I discovered what you do, what I do anyway, and that is I always ask them first. 
and then I always disagree with what they say, even if it's right, especially if it's right, if I think it's right. And that way, it emphasizes what is the great truth, and that is, you don't teach them, they learn. And they love to learn. They love to learn. And almost always they do. And if they don't want to learn, they can't learn. And so that came, I, I think about the Constitution of the United States differently. And you know, I was 46 years old when I came to Hillsdale College. I was a mature man known to be an expert on the Constitution. And I rethought everything I think about it because of watching those kids' faces in class. And that means I do not believe. I, what I thought when I came to the college was, if we can get them in, we can always help them. I discarded that soon. They have to want to. It needs to be really hard to get in. Because it's going to be hard when you get there, and you have to want to. So you're, you're correct, sir. And that, and that means, by the way, like people always, you know, somebody was saying last night, there are no more jobs left in America because of technology. You know what Lincoln said about that? See, God made every human being with one mouth and two hands and one head, the plain implication being the head was to guide the hands in the feeding of the mouth. Everybody is a mouth and everybody is a job. Just let them work. And also, don't subsidize them not to. So you're just right about that, sir. And, and the reason Winston Churchill was different from Hitler can be summarized in this. He thought human beings could and should govern themselves. It's why in wars, tyrants always do well in the beginning. All their forces are united, and they can count exactly how many they've got. And they all get ready in advance. But then as the war goes, they find out that the other guys that they have attacked actually have infinite resources, as many resources as there are people and things. They just couldn't count them at the outset. You're just so right about that. So we have time for one more question. Dr. Arn, I have two things. Number one, uh, Mr. Donald Trump, that many have obviously accepted that he lost a popular vote, but I disagree along with Liberty Council and Grassfire and many others. Uh, it's on the process of investigation. I do believe he won majority of the popular vote as well as electoral vote. And number two, this is my question, you said we are to look to ourselves and rebuild our military. And what would be the process of accomplishing and doing that? Because currently our military is not ready to combat any type of war situation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know what, first of all, I'm very glad that they're looking into voter fraud and I hope that they, uh, I hope that there is, if there is a lot, they discover a lot and I suspect that there is a lot. Why do I suspect that? Because uh, people are encouraged to get driving licenses in several states uh, not being citizens and encouraged to register to vote at the same time without checking whether they are and there are large forces that have a partisan interest in that. And call me cynical but that looks like there might be something wrong there. <laughs> About the military I can tell you that uh, a friend of mine of many years standing now, a close friend, is Senator Cotton of the Armed Services Committee and it just so happens that he's pushing a supplementary $30 billion bill that uh, would go through in a month or less. And its purpose would be to spend a bunch of money this year on readiness and some back pay issues. And then they're thinking about a much bigger defense budget for next year. And that's my point, by the way. 
And if, if Donald Trump were weakening the country, proposing, and, and I, when I say weaken, here's what I mean. I mean, that let's say that Vladimir Putin is everything that the worst people say about him. And the, the worst things said about him are not that he's Joe Stalin, because God, that'd be something to be that. Let's say he were Joe Stalin, right? Well, the kind of power that is necessary to any conversation is military might. That guy will hurt you unless you're in a position to kill him, because that's what he was. He was a killer, a mass killer, in the name of some good that he thought he was serving. And so the point is, I would suspect these things a lot more about Donald Trump, except he's doing that, and all over that. So good, right? And so there you go. That's what you do, and you do it right away. And I, another question I'll just confide in you, because I happen to have known this guy, Cotton, since he was in undergraduate school, and I know him well, and he's an important man, going to be president of the United States one of these days. If I have anything to say about it, and I do, <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, I said to him the other night, something a couple weeks ago, a month ago, I said, do we know what to build? You know, things are changing so fast. Aircraft carriers are very vulnerable. Planes can be shot out of the sky. Everything's drones, right? Do we know what to build? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, good. I'm not worried anymore. <laughs> you don't either.